Okay, uh, good evening everyone um, and thanks for joining us for tonight's um, talk which is, as Caroline said, um, practical ultrasound of the adrenals, the lymph nodes and the pancreas. Um, now, an uh, uh, ultrasound of the adrenal lim adrenals, lymph nodes and pancreas is a bit of the holy grail in ultrasound. It seems to be the one question that I get asked more often than, than not and, and even if I'm running a um, a very basic abdominal ultrasound course, um, I always get asked, can you show me how to scan the adrenals? Can you show me how to find the pancreas? Um, so it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's something that, that everyone seems to want to do in, in ultrasound and, and I think some that, it's something that, that a lot of people struggle with. So hopefully um, tonight uh, this will help, help you all. So, um, I think the starting point would be to say that adrenals, lymph nodes and pancreas are more challenging structures to scan. Um, they don't just hit you in the face like kidneys and spleens and livers do. Um, you have to look for them. Um, and really you have to use the surrounding structures to find them. So you have to have good knowledge of the anatomy um, that surrounds the, these structures. Um, I think it's also important to be able to know how to drive your ultrasound machine and get the absolute best out of it as well. Um, so knowing how to um, swap probes, um, optimize probe frequency, settings, um, these four magic buttons that I've been talking about for the last few weeks, um, they're all really important when, in terms of um, getting the best out of your um, abdominal ultrasound um, and seeing the best quality images of small structures like the adrenals, the pancreas and the lymph nodes. And you know, you have to accept that it takes practice. So if we start with the abdominal lymph nodes, um, we tend to find the abdominal lymph nodes clustered around um, the vascular trees, if you like, or the blood vessels. Um, so we tend to find abdominal lymph nodes um, around um, the mesenteric vascular tree, um, up to the portal vein um, or clustered around the aorta and the caudal vena cava. And you can see from the list on the right here, there's a whole host of different um, lymph nodes that you can find in the abdomen. Um, uh, what I've done is I've circled the, the ones that we see most easily and most commonly. So the splenic, um, which you would find along the splenic veins um, and the left pancreatic lobes the pancreatic duodenal, which you find near the caudal duodenal flexure, which you can see number three here, um, and what I call the mesenteric lymph nodes, the jejunal and colic, which you would find along the mesenteric vascular tree. Um, I, I call this the middle of the middle. It's the middle of the abdomen. It's where you would expect to see these, um, these lymph nodes. And then uh, along the aorta, really the, the main ones that you would expect to see um, fairly easily would be the medial iliac lymph nodes. And the medial iliac lymph nodes, you can see these are number 10 here. Um, you tend to find these at the aortic trifurcation. So what I do is I find the aorta and I slide caudally to the trifurcation and then I'm looking around that trifurcation point for, um, for lymph nodes in that region. So what do um, normal lymph nodes look like? Um, well, they're usually isoechoic or slightly hypoechoic compared to the surrounding structures. Um, they're uniform in echogenicity um, and they tend to have a thin hyperechoic capsule. So you can see a mesenteric lymph node here um, and it's got a thin hyperechoic capsule. Um, it's slightly hypoechoic and it's uniform in its echogenicity. Um, the old textbooks used to talk about a maximum thickness of five millimeters. Um, but I think nowadays we tend to be more um, interested in the shape of the, the lymph nodes. So normal lymph nodes tend to be um, long and slender. So if you do a short axis to long axis ratio, um, it should be less than 0.5. Um, whereas if we look at, um, oh well, let's, let's just have a look at a mesenteric lymph node. Um, so here's one here that you can just see at the, towards the bottom of the screen, long and fairly slender. Um, so if we talk about abnormal lymph nodes, um, they, are, they tend to be short and plump, a little bit like me. Um, so the short to long axis ratio um, tends to be um, 
if it's greater than 0.5, that tends to be predictive for neoplasia. Um, and if we're looking at the difference between reactive lymph nodes and um, neoplastic lymph nodes, reactive lymph nodes tend to have a hyperechoic hilus, whereas um, neoplastic lymph nodes tend to um, more commonly be hypoechoic. Um, and if you look at the echo texture as well, neoplastic lymph nodes quite often become markedly heterogeneous um, compared to um, uh, reactive lymph nodes. And if we talk about um, the situation in people, um, they say that benign lymph nodes um, primarily have um, higher color, flow, uh, color blood flow, um, whereas with malignancies, um, the color flow seems to be more peripheral. Um, I don't think that has been transferred into um, animals yet, but um, it'd be interesting to see if anyone does research on that. But I would also say that overlap does exist between reactive um, and neoplastic lymph nodes. So here's a reactive lymph node. Um, this is a, a, a lymph node from a puppy that was, I think she was eight weeks old um, and just did an upset tummy. And this was just an incidental finding of some reactive um, mesenteric lymph nodes, as you can see here. So they're a little bit plumper, they're hypoechoic, um, uh, or actually, sorry, they're, they're, they're a little bit hyperechoic there, actually. Um, so that's a reactive lymph node, an example. Whereas the next slide here, um, what we've got is a short axis through the medial iliac lymph nodes. And um, so um, just to get your landmarks, what we have here is the aorta and the cordibina cava here. Um, and these golf ball like structures, hypoechoic structures, are um, the neoplastic medial iliac lymph nodes. So this is a German shepherd that had a, an anal mass um, and had these huge. Um, and neoplastic lymph nodes. Um, and this is another case just for um, to give you a, a flavour of what these can look like. So what you can see here is a long, a long axis view of the aorta um, and below is the cordovina cava. Um, to the left here or cranially is the kidney and what you can see again is some malignant golf ball like structures which are the medial iliac lymph nodes and these are showing uh, signs of malignancy. Um, the heterogeneous, and there's a whole cluster of them. There's actually one, two, three you can see along there. You can just see the aortic trifurcation. See the three fingers that you can see there. Um, and this is the same view in short axis. So what we have is the aorta in the middle um, and these golf ball like structures, which are the neoplastic medial iliac lymph nodes. And then um, this is a mesenteric lymph node, or mesenteric lymph nodes, I should say, plural. Um, so this, th these lymph nodes are massive. This is a five centimeter marker that you can see on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and this is typical of what you see with, with lymphoma. Um, and in actual fact, this was the, the post-mortem of, of this particular case. Here's another lymphoma. So this is um, a medial iliac lymph node that's enlarged and hypoechoic, and it's a bit heterogeneous as well. And this is the aortic trifurcation. So um, this is viewing the patient's caudal is to my left and cranial is to my right. So the trifurcation is here, and you can see the um, big plump lymph node there. And in actual fact, in the same patient, um, this was this dog's spleen as well. Um, and this was confirmed lymphoma by FNA. So that's um, lymph nodes, um, very briefly. Um, the next thing to talk about is the adrenal glands. Um, so this is the holy grail point. Um, so scanning the adrenals, um, these are small structures and they can be challenging to, to look at, absolutely. Um, and in terms of location, um, you'll find the adrenals medial to the kidneys. Um, and adjacent to the aorta on the left. So the left adrenal sits next to the aorta, whereas the right adrenal sits next to the caudal vena cava. Um, so to, to get up to these structures, it does require quite a high clip. If you don't clip high enough, you're really not going to get your probe um, easily into the, the space to, to find these. Um, so yeah, a high clip is required if you're going to, to get really good images of the adrenals. Um, and I've also put in here requires a good quality machine and a high frequency probe. Um, 
I do accept that in practice, um, we don't have, all have referral level um, ultrasound machines and, and the luxury of having lots of different probes. Um, but there are ways of getting the best out of your machine, whatever machine you've got. Um, and so you can see um, adrenals um, on most machines. So sedation, I think, helps um, to relax the abdomen. Um, and what that helps to do is al it allows you to push your probe um, closer to the, the adrenal gland. So the closer you can get your probe to the adrenal gland, the more you're going to see, the, the better the definition you're going to see of that adrenal gland. Um, if you've got a linear probe and a high frequency probe, great, I would, I would switch to that. Um, but you have to accept that a lot of these linear probes have got quite a big footprint um, and that can hamper um, getting into that tight space to get to the adrenal glands, especially if we talk about the right adrenal gland. Sometimes you need a microconvex probe to, to get into that sort of tight space. So what do the adrenals look like? So if we start with the left adrenal gland, um, it's hypoechoic. So the image top right here is showing a hypoechoic left adrenal gland. Um, it's found medial to the left kidney. Um, and the aorta is my landmark for finding that. Um, so uh, it's close to the aorta and cranial to the origin of the left renal artery. Um, and the left phrenico-abdominal artery and vein are past dorsal and ventral to the midpoint of the body of the, the gland. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in the slides, the coming slides. Um, so um, what's, what sort of size would we expect the adrenal glands to be? I've always worked on this, um, which is the, um, the caudal pole. So the short axis um, width of the caudal pole, um, we tend to talk about uh, an upper limit of 7.4 millimeters. Um, there are some papers that have been published more recently um, and they talk about a cutoff actually of six millimeters um, for distinguishing between normal and um, dogs with Cushing syndrome, pituitary dependent um, hyperadrenal cortisism. So, okay, how do we find the left adrenal gland, uh, the holy grail of ultrasound? Um, so, um, I said the landmarks are going to be the aorta. So what, is it, what I do is I find the aorta first, and then I find the left renal artery. So the left renal artery comes off the aorta and it coasts caudally and then cranially towards the, the left kidney. So just for orientation, cranial is to my left um, and caudal is to my right here. So I've got the dog in right lateral recumbency and I've got my probe high up on the body wall on this dog's left side. So I find the aorta and I find the left renal artery and there's a hook that's formed by that left renal artery as it goes caudally and then cranially towards the kidney. And this is the area that I'm interested in, just under that hook um, to find that adrenal gland. So just to show you that, here's the aorta. Here is the um, renal artery, the left renal artery. And I'm looking somewhere down here to find this adrenal gland. So once you've got these landmarks um, uh, and you're, you're happy, you're roughly where you want to be, um, don't worry about keeping the kidney in the shot. We want to try and start um, twisting a probe um, and fanning around this area here and um, to see if we can find that adrenal gland. So um, if you've got color flow, I think that's helpful. It, it helps identify that left renal artery. So we'll just play this one here. You can see the left renal artery in vein heading up towards the kidney, which is up here. Um, so I'm looking somewhere in this region for um, the adrenal gland, the left adrenal gland. Okay, so here it is. Press play, aorta, left renal artery, and here's the adrenal gland here. It's hypoechoic and it's peanut shaped. And I can just see a little white area crossing that. That's a phrenico abdominal uh, uh, artery and vein that cross there, phrenico abdominal vessels. Okay, now, how can I make that image better? Um, and I, I can make it better. Um, what I could do is press a little bit harder um, because we're scanning here at almost at four centimeters depth. So if I could get that to two centimeters depth, we could improve things. Um, if I also swap to a higher frequency probe, um, then I should be able to get more definition as well. So that's what I did in this case. So this is exactly the same animal, um, just with a, a higher, higher definition probe. So look at the difference here. So here we have 
our left adrenal gland. There's the right, uh, sorry, there's the left renal artery. The aorta's down here, so it's sitting next to the aorta. Um, and here's that little bright white area, which is the, where the phrenico abdominal vessels are. I'll just play that now. See how much more clarity that you can get to the adrenal gland, that peanut shape. And if you look, um, I've also squeezed a little bit harder with my probe and I've reduced the distance between the probe and the adrenal gland. So if you can get the, your probe closer, it makes a huge difference to the quality of the image as well. Um, so I've just put some color flow on this just to show the vessel running across. You see a little wisp of blue from time to time just here, and that's the phrenico abdominal vessels. Okay, um, if you're not convinced by this, um, this is a more recent one that I've done. So aorta, left renal artery, um, adrenal gland, and there's the phrenico abdominal um, artery and vein. Okay, what about the right adrenal gland? The right adrenal gland is more tricky because it tends to sit a little bit further cranially. Um, so you're having to, to point much more extremely cranially um, to find that. Um, so what does it look like? Um, it's also hypoechoic and elongated um, or ovoid or sometimes it's described as wedge shape and it's located this time closer to the caudal vena cava than the aorta um, and again it's close to the right renal artery and vein and the right phrenico abdominal artery and vein past the dorsal and ventral um, to the mid body of the, the adrenal gland so um, apologies for my uh, mock-up drawing, but it's, it's just to try and um, get some landmarks in your head. Um, so, and apologies for, for my, my attempt at drawing a right adrenal gland, it's terrible. Um, I'm not very good at this, but um, it's just to give you a, a flavor of, of, uh, of landmarks. So um, this would be with our dog in left lateral recumbency now. Um, so head is to the right and tail is to the left. Um, so what I would do is I would find the caudal vena cava, which sits closest to the probe, and the aorta, and I find them in the midpoint of the abdomen, and then I slide my probe cranially until I can find the kidney, until I roughly get the right renal artery, um, and if I um, sweep between the right kidney and fan down the way or down towards the table, um, what we then see is the caudal vena cava and sitting just under the caudal vena cava um, between the caudal vena cava and the aorta would be the right adrenal gland. So here's a, an ultrasound image just to show that point. Caudal vena cava, aorta, so they're diverging away from each other um, and just under the, the caudal vena cava here's the right adrenal gland here. And for landmarks the kidney would be up here. It's out of, out, of, um, out of view here. So that's the right adrenal gland. So what about abnormal um, adrenal glands? Um, most common abnormality, I suppose, that we would see is Cushing syndrome and pituitary dependent hyperadrenocorticism um, accounts for about 80% of dogs with hyperadrenocorticism. Um, so Ultrasound alone is not diagnostic, um, but if your lab tests are supportive um, and you've got symmetrical enlargement of both adrenals, then we'd be thinking about pituitary dependent disease. Um, so two enlarged adrenal glands, pituitary dependent. If we've only got one enlarged adrenal gland, um, we're more likely to be talking about um, ADH or adrenal tumors or adrenal dependent hyperadrenal cortisone. I think you have to be aware that overlap exists um, and not all um, PDH cases uh, have got symmetrical enlargement and you ha also have to accept that some measure um, within normal limits as well. Okay, um, so that just gives you a, a, an idea as to what, you, what you'd be looking for with, um, uh, with Cushing's disease. And what else do we see in, in adrenal glands if it's not Cushing's disease? We do sometimes see adrenal nodules and masses. Um, so we see cortical adenomas, um, we see adenocarcinomas, we see pheochromocytomas. We can sometimes get metastatic disease. We can even get hyperplasia. Um, so we must recognize that um, cortical tumors 
uh, are not always functional. Um, so there may not be signs of um, hyperadrenocorticism. So you may stumble a, a, on an adrenal mass um, in a dog that's got no signs of, of Christian syndrome at all. Um, but I think bear in mind that ultrasound changes are non-specific. Um, so you can't say, uh, oh, this looks like a cortical adenocarcinoma or this looks like a pheochromocytoma. However, I think um, if you've got a, a, an adrenal mass and it's greater than four centimetres, the feeling is that that's more likely to represent malignant neoplasia. Um, and if you've got evidence of invasion of local tissues, um, then that's more compatible with malignancy. Um, and for example, carcinomas or pheochromocytomas. Um, and one thing um, to look out for, and if you look for these, you will find them eventually. Um, look for an invasion of the caudal vena cava via more often than not the right phrenico abdominal vein um, and thrombus formation in the caudal vena cava. It's something that you do see sometimes in, in cases, and I've got a nice case to show you as well. So um, that phrenico abdominal vein, um, you can actually identify that. So if you can find the adrenal gland and you can find the caudal vena cava and you really zoom into that area, um, and if you just take some, take your time, some bit of patience, you will find that phrenico abdominal vein. If you don't believe me, here it is here. So here's the right adrenal gland, and here's the phrenico abdominal vein run, running into the caudal vena cava in a, in a normal case. So what happens when you've got an abnormal case? This is a nice illustration of an, an abnormal case. So this is this dog's left kidney, and the left adrenal gland is, is huge. Um, so I went and had a look at the opposite side, the right adrenal gland, so this is the right kidney now. And what you can see is the caudal vena cava running down here. And there's the right adrenal gland. Now, what can we see in here? If we just focus in on the caudal vena cava, there is a mass in the caudal vena cava, mass of thrombus in there. There's the phrenico abdominal vein here, and here's the right adrenal gland. So this, this dog has got a mass in the right adrenal gland that is um, spreading up the phrenico abdominal vein and into the caudal vena cava. Um, in actual fact, I scanned this dog's heart before I scanned this dog's abdomen um, because he presented um, because of his syncopal. Um, and he had a, a, a murmur that was, was a new murmur as well. So I scanned his heart and this is what I found um, on the next slide, hopefully. Um, I found this in his heart, uh, which then directed me into the abdomen. So this is something spectacular. So here's the mass in the uh, caudal vena cava that you can see here. Okay, look in the chest now. So here's the left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And there's a big thrombus that's straddling the tricuspid valve that you can see there. So that's why this dog was syncopal. And if you look at this in short axis view, so here's the aorta, this is the right ventricular outflow tract. This is the tricuspid valve at this level. And this is the thrombus that you can see popping in and out of the, um, the tricuspid valve. So it was that that I saw that made me think, okay, um, there's a thrombus in the heart. I don't have a good explanation for why it's in there. Um, what drains into the caudal vena, sorry, what drains into the right atrium? Um, let's have a look at the caudal vena cava. And I was already thinking about, you know, is this an adrenal mass that's, that's causing this? So a bit of a spectacular case. Here's, here it is again, just in slow motion. Unbelievable. Okay, and then the, the last thing that we'll talk about tonight is the pancreas. Um, and this is nicely described in this uh, article here sonographic evaluation of the normal and abnormal pancreas. Um, so if you want to have a, a good read, and it's not a, not a difficult read at all, um, that's a really good um, reference paper. Um, so the pancreas, um, to find a normal pancreas, you really need to, um, to understand the anatomy, the local anatomy, and to be able to drive yourself into where the pancreas would be because it doesn't pop out slap you in the face. It's not something that's really obvious to find. 
So the landmarks, um, so for the right limb of the pancreas, so we have a right limb, we have a body, and we have a left limb of the pancreas, okay? Um, and so the right limb of the pancreas, um, the landmarks would be the duodenum, because we know that the pancreas sits medial to the duodenum, and it would be the right kidney. So if you find, um, if you're looking for the pancreas, if, if you can find the right kidney and the duodenum, the pancreas tends to um, sit in between the right kidney and the duodenum. Um, the body tends to be found uh, around the portal vein, which is not really shown very well in this image. Um, the portal vein tends to be very close to the body. And then the left limb of the pancreas, if you think anatomically, it sits caudal to the stomach. Um, it sits cranial to the transverse colon, um, and it's, it sits adjacent, so certainly the left tip of the pancreas sits adjacent to the spleen. So that would be your landmarks for helping you identify the pancreas. What does a normal pancreas look like? Um, well, it tends to be homogeneous. It's thin and amorphous. Um, I've said before, it's difficult to identify, except that, um, because it's got a very similar epigenicity to mesenteric fat. Um, and certainly in the dog, it's the right limb that's easiest to scan. Um, and it's normally identified dorsomedial to the duodenum. So you find the duodenum uh, and that helps you find the pancreas. And you would see it medial to the right kidney. Um, and if you do see it, I would be looking for the vessels that run up and down the, the right limb of the pancreas, which is the pancreatic duodenal vein uh, and artery that you can see. Um, in cats, so I mentioned dogs, in cats, um, it tends to be the body of the pancreas and the left limb of the pancreas that are more obvious. So cats, left limb and body, dog would be the, the right limb, would be the easiest to see. Um, and there's some reference ranges in terms of um, what's normal for the pancreas of the cat. So um, it tends to be isochoic or slightly hyperechoic to the adjacent liver lobes. Um, as I said before, the left limb is larger and easier to identify. Um, and there's some sizes that are suggested there. Um, for the left lobe, the body, and the right lobe of the pancreas. And in cats, you tend to be able to see the pancreatic duct, not so easy to see in dogs. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a reference size for the pancreatic duct as well. So how do we find the pancreas? So yeah, the, the, how do we find the, the pancreas? Um, so this is the right limb of the pancreas we're talking about. Um, so step one uh, would be to identify the duodenum. So the duodenum uh, is the only structure, intestinal structure, that lies tight against the body wall on the right-hand side, and it doesn't deviate from the body wall except its cranial and caudal limits. Okay, and the, the duodenum is also the thickest segment of bowel. So what you can see here, that's the skin surface there, and you've got the duodenum sitting right under the skin. So once you've identified the duodenum and you're absolutely happy that you've identified the duodenum, um, so this would be our dog um, in left lateral recumbency. So you're scanning on the right body wall. And so this would be a dog just for orientation. Um, the head would be to the right of the screen and the tail would be to the left of the screen. So here's your duodenum. What I then do um, is I take my probe and I rotate 90 degrees um, to the dog's spine. So take the button to the dog's spine and you get a short axis view of the duodenum just like this. And if you get a short axis view of the duodenum, then you can see the pancreas and it's a triangular shaped structure that you can see immediately adjacent to the duodenum. Um, and you can see this pancreatic duodenal vessel just um, in the middle pumping away as well. So color flow Doppler can sometimes help you with that as well. Okay. So once you find that short axis view, we're absolutely sure it's the pancreas. Oh, by the way, um, sometimes in some dogs, you can get a nice view where you can see the duodenum and short axis, the pancreas, and then the kidney um, sitting in, um, to the left of the pancreas, if you like, um, on, on this view. Um, so, okay, we've rotated, we've found the pancreas, we've rotated 90 degrees, um, so what we would need, want to do next to get it in longitudinal view um, is keep that um, area in view and slide back to the longitudinal view, okay? So, and what you get here is this. So duodenum, and I'm just coming off the duodenum, um, dorsomedially, duodenum, 
and there's the pancreas there. Duodenum, pancreas. Duodenum, pancreas. So really what I'm doing is I'm using the landmarks to find it because um, it's very, very similar in echogenicity to the, the surrounding structures. So this is what you get. So this is the pancreas that you can just see here. And you can just see a little vessel pumping away there as well. Okay, very, very thin, very amorphous. Um, so that's the normal pancreas. So what about pancreatitis? Um, I think what we can say about pancreatitis is that um, the appearance can be variable, but with acute pancreatitis, the first thing is it becomes enlarged, um, so it's easier to find. Um, it becomes diffusely hypoechoic, um, and you start to get reaction in the surrounding fat. So the surrounding fat becomes um, unhappy, if you like, and angry, um, and very bright white. So you get a good contrast between the bright white fat and the hypoechoic pancreas. Um, so the right limb is easier to identify in the dog. Um, and the other thing is the margins can be quite ill-defined as well. So here's a, here's a case of pancreatitis. So what we've got is a duodenum um, in the long axis. Um, and you can see here, I can't spell pancreas either. <laughs> so here we go. So I'm using that landmark to say, yep, that is definitely pancreas. So I'm sweeping off the duodenum and there's a the pancreas. Yeah. So what can we say about this pancreas? Um, well, if I just slide, go to the next slide, what we can say is that um, it, this one here is certainly heterogeneous. I think there's some edema uh, in the, the lobules. Um, it's hypoechoic compared to the surrounding structures and this fat is bright white. Um, so there's a good contrast between the mesenteric fat um, uh, and the pancreas that you can see here. So here's another case. Um, so this is that short axis view. Um, I've rotated the other way, so the pancreas is on the opposite side, but you can see the pancreas just here. Um, you can see, you can see all, all this tissue around. It's very angry, it's very sore. And, and you can imagine this dog is in pain. It's panting as, as, uh, as I'm doing this scan. So this is an uncomfortable thing. So um, this is an, another thing that can be helpful with acute pancreatitis. If it's painful to squeeze over that area, um, then that would maybe be an indicator that you've actually got pancreatitis going on. But that's quite a spectacular one that you can see there. So here's another one again, um, opposite way this time, duodenum, pancreas, and there's some edema between the lobules that you can see there as well. Um, and if, if I zoomed out of this, you would see a lot more of the, the, the surrounding fat um, uh, and connective tissue that's, that's really not very happy at all. And this is what pancreatic edema looks like. Um, so you can imagine that there's all this fluid that's developed between the lobules um, and it gives this kind of tiger stripe appearance. Um, so pancreatic edema is not um, pathognomonic for just pancreatitis. You do sometimes get it with hypoalbuminemia um, and you do sometimes get it with portal hypertension as well. So just remember these as differentials. Um, but it's something that, that we recognize um, in a lot of pancreatitis cases as well. Um, so here's a tiger stripe appearance that you can see here. Um, again, just you've got um, all this edema between the lobules and it gives this kind of stripy appearance. And I think I've got one more here. Yeah, duodenum and pancreas. So all the time I'm just, I'm just using the local structures to be absolutely certain that I'm scanning the pancreas. And I can actually spell it in this one here. I'm doing well. And we also see some cases of a severe acute necrotizing pancreatitis. So these are the ones that look a bit like this. And they tend to have a, an effusion around them. Um, and it's just a more severe version of the same thing. So these tend to be much sicker patients. Um, the mesentery is very reactive and hyperechoic. Um, and as I said before, you get pancreatic edema um, as numerous hypoechoic stripes in a lot of cases. So this is the sort of thing that, uh, that you see. Yeah, horrible. Um, so here we have some 
free fluid um, around the, the abdomen and this, this pancreas, you can see the pancreas just coming in here. So pancreas, free fluid. So this is a, a nasty, horrible, severe acute pancreatitis that you've got. And what else do we find in the pancreas? Um, other things we find maybe incidentally. So you get pseudocysts that can be caused by pancreatitis. You get retention cysts caused by pancreatic duct blockage. You can sometimes get abscesses. These just all look like fluid filled structures. Um, and so you would really need to do an ultrasound guided FNA to, to differentiate between them. Um, neoplasia um, and nodular hyperplasia. Certainly um, nodular hyperplasia you can occasionally see in um, older dogs. Um, and these appear as hypoechoic, hypoechoic nodules. Um, pancreatic tumors, um, for example, adenocarcinomas you see in the ACNA cells and ductal epithelium, uh, epithelium um, and they, they tend to develop in the central portion. And as they grow, they tend to compress and invade local structures. Um, I would probably say that um, it's quite difficult to differentiate reliably between neoplasia and pancreatitis. Um, so I, I think really you need FNA or biopsy to to definitively say whether you know what you've got going on, uh, and I think we do struggle with some some of these cases without doing biopsies. Um, so if you have a case like this one here, um, who's got a pancreas um, that's um, not 100% normal, um, and you're you're struggling, don't forget things like thoracic radiography because sometimes these. Um, will give you the answer that you're looking for um, and just help to uh, help you to get to the bottom of these cases. So that was just a quick run through of um, adrenals and pancreas and lymph nodes. Um, I hope that was useful to you um, and if there's any questions feel free to ask questions. Thank you so much Mark, that was um absolutely brilliant fantastic presentation brilliant images i've just got one question here about scanning the pancreas um, and it says um do you scan the pancreas from both sides or do you um, yeah. um so they, when you're scanning the right side or, or yeah so this this is me this is me personally so there, there are different techniques and i haven't gone into all of the techniques this is just my personal opinion um, of and, and how I like to, to scan the pancreas. So yes, you can scan uh, if you have a, a dog in um, left lateral recumbency, sorry, right lateral recumbency, um, you, scan, you can scan the pancreas um, from that region um, and you would have to, to put your probe really against the table to get up and under to the duodenum. So I tend not to, to look at it um, that way. Um, the way I do it, so if I'm looking for the right lobe of the pancreas, um, I tend to have the dog in left lateral recumbency, so my probe is on the right body wall, and um, so you're right up against the, um, the duodenum, um, and in that view, you get a longitudinal axis of the duodenum, just like what I showed you, I'll see if I can find it. Yes, I, I do it from the, the, the dog's right hand side, so in this view, as I said before, the head would be to the right and the tail would be to the left. So the dog's left side is down on the table. Um, and I find the duodenum first and then rotate 90 degrees. Now, depending how far um, cranially that you go, um, in some dogs you can get the kidney and the pancreas and the duodenum all in short axis in the same view. Um, and that's nice to absolutely confirm that you've got the pancreas there. So mm -hmm. it's just taking that one there um, and then rotating, hang on, back. Rotating 90 to get that view there. Yes, we have done that before getting it into the, the um, uh, transverse access just to get the, that. It's a lot the easier to, if you, can, well. if you can't see it, it's a lot easier to find it in transverse view. Um, because you then, you, if you can see it there and you can see the vessel in the middle, um, it's just so much, you, yeah. you're so much more confident with it. Yeah. If you can get that view with the duodenum, the pancreas and the kidney just um, to here, so your button would be pointing towards the dog's spine to get that view, mm -hmm. rotated, um, so you would have your button 
um, caudally when you start in the long axis view, mm -hmm. um, and then you rotate 90 degrees uh, the button up to the spine. Um, uh, and then you get this view here, as I say, if you can get the duodenum, the pancreas, and the kidney in that short axis view, then you're absolutely sure you've got the pancreas. Um, if you're struggling that much to find the pancreas, then I would argue it's, it's more likely to be normal anyway. Out of interest, do you yeah. sedate all your patients for abdominal ultrasound? Um, I don't, but I, I'm probably sedating more now than I ever did. Um, so I, I think when you're starting to look at um, and fine tune your abdominal ultrasound scans and you're looking for really fine detail, I, I prefer to have them sedated if I can. Um, because it just is so much easier if you've got a relaxed patient. I mean, if you've got a dog that, that was, is happy to lie there, by the way, I, I use loads of um, Adaptil and Feliway spray before I start. Um, and, you know, if you've got a really chilled out, relaxed dog, then I'll just do it without sedation. Um, but, you know, and, and I think there's a technique to, um, to pushing your probe into the abdomen. You just do it gently and, um, uh, and, and, and just slowly um, increase the pressure. Uh, and a lot of dogs will, will allow you to, to push harder and harder until you get closer to the structure you're trying to, to find. I think there's some dogs that just, uh, as soon as you put any pressure on, they just resist. Um, and these are the ones that really, to do your abdominal ultrasound scan thoroughly, you, you do need to have them sedated and relaxed. So yeah, that's my take on it. Mm, um, thank you.